Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we're going to continue our reading of Over the Gate by Miss Reed. It's summer, and people are feeling like vacationing and moving about, and Miss Reed is considering the possibility of a new job. The job which had caught my eye was the headship of a junior and infant school in South Devon. I knew the little town fairly well from visiting it at holiday times and because I had friends in the neighborhood. It was a market town, rather smaller than Caxley, about five miles from the coast, and situated away from the main roads which were so busy in summertime. I remembered the school particularly. It was a pleasant old building with a new wing recently added and an attractive schoolhouse adjoining it. A peach tree spread its branches fanwise over its front wall, which faced south and at the back there was a sheltered walled garden with some fine fruit trees and lawns. One could be very happy indeed there, I had no doubt, and when my friends wrote to tell me of the vacancy and to urge me to apply for it, I fell to thinking seriously of the matter. The biggest attraction to me was the climate. Fairacre can be bitterly cold in the winter, and the number of gnarled rheumatic -y old people in our midst constitutes an awful warning to those with a tendency to rheumatism and its allied diseases. Apart from an occasional bout of influenza, I ailed nothing, but the last winter or two I had been having twinges of rheumatism which I did not like to think of as simply old age. Fairacre School, too, was renowned for its drafts and the inefficiency of its heating system, and latterly I had come to dread the winter months with their fierce blast of bitter air from the skylight above my desk, concentrated on the nape of my neck, and the particularly spiteful draft that hit one round the ankles and came from the icy wastes of the outside lobby. It would be good to work in a snug building tucked into the side of a hill and with most of its windows facing south. The very thought of that soft, mild air made me feel hopeful. I read my friend's advice. I read the advertisement a dozen times. I looked out of my schoolhouse window. It was a blustery April evening with a spatter of hail and snow. I bravely sent for the application forms. That had been a week ago. The forms awaited my attention still, propped behind the coffee pot on the dresser, my usual filing place. I must get them off this week if I really intended to apply. I looked again at Fairacre, spread below me, and sighed at the difficulties of making up one's mind. "'You got the bellyache?' asked Joseph Cog solicitously, sitting down beside me. "'No, no,' I assured him. "'I was just thinking how pretty the village looked from here.' A few more children left their pursuits to join us. "'It's the prettiest place in England,' declared Ernest stoutly. "'Srite!' echoed young Richard loyally. My auntie, said John, lives at Winchelsea, and she says that's the prettiest place. Maybe she don't know Fairacre, suggested someone reasonably. What's it like, anyway, this old Winchelsea? Winchelsea, replied John, nettled. Well, it's a funny place, because it used to be right by the seaside, and now there's a whole lot of flat fields between the town and the sea. Below the down, the stranded town, what may be tied forlornly waits, I quoted, with what I thought was rather a beautiful inflection, John looked startled. I don't know about that, but that's what my auntie told me. She said the sea was right up to the town once. Likely, ain't it, said Joseph Coggs scornfully. I rose to my feet. I was glad to have some interruption to my thoughts, and it was time we were getting back. I'll get the map out when we are in school, I promised them, and you shall see for yourselves. First one to reach the lane has a suite. Off you go. Shrieking and squeaking, they tumbled down the steep slope of the grassy hill, leaving me to descend more circumspectly behind them. In the lane, where the rough track ends and the tarmac begins, Dr. Martin's car waited out Laber outside Laburnum Villas. As I approached the vociferous mob awaiting me, each claiming that he had arrived first, the doctor came out of one of the ugly pair of houses and watched with some amusement as I quelled the riot. 
Playing truant, he asked. I said we were. Very sensible, too. We none of us get enough fresh air these days. When I first came to Fairacre, it was lack of decent food which gave me most of my patience. Now it's too much food and not enough air and exercise. He climbed into his car with a grunt of exertion, then leant from the window and laughed. I need nor myself, he said. How's my old friend Mrs. Pringle still suffering with her leg? When it suits her, I replied. There are no secrets to hide from Dr. Martin. He has known us all in Fairacre much too long to be hoodwinked. Forty or fifty years, I thought suddenly, Dr. Martin has lived and worked in Fairacre. I had a sudden desire to ask him if he had ever felt like moving, but restrained myself. Are you feeling quite fit? he asked, an observant eye cocked quizzically upon me. Yes, thank you, I said hastily, just thinking about something, that's all. You look a trifle pale to me, said the doctor, twinkling. Is it love? No, indeed, I said with spirit. I am too old for such capers. More likely to be advancing senility. I'm beginning to suspect that rheumatism is trying to infiltrate my old bones. You aren't the only one in Fairacre, said the doctor, starting his car. Let me know if it gets any worse, that's all. We get such plaguy cold winters here, that's the trouble. He waved cheerfully and drove off, hooting to shoo my children to the side of the narrow lane. The memory of that south-facing Devon school returned to me with overwhelming intensity as I made my way back to Fairacre School amongst my clamorous pupils. "'Can I get it out now?' asked John as we clanged across the door scraper. "'Get what out?' I asked, bemused. "'By the map. You said as you was going to show us Winchelsea and all that.' He sounded aggrieved. I pulled myself together and approached the map cupboard. It is called the map cupboard, and it does indeed house the maps, but that is not all. Somehow, everything that has no proper home gets thrown in the map cupboard. There are cricket stumps, old tennis shoes, a pile of china paint palettes which have not been used for years, some dilapidated rainbow annuals adored by the children during wet dinner hours, part of a train set, a large tin full of assorted pieces of mechano, and a rusty hurricane lamp which, we tell each other, might come in handy. The maps jostled together in one corner, and ever since I came to Fairacre I have meant to label them properly and hang them in some sort of order. In practice, I go through muscles of the human body, the disposition of the tribes of Israel, the resuscitation of those suffering from electrocution, the tonic sulfa modulator, and a number of maps ranging from Greenland's icy mountains to India's coral strand until I find the one I am searching for. This afternoon was no exception. At length, however, the map of the British Isles was hung over the blackboard, and I began my lesson on coastal erosion. Refreshed by their outing, the children gave me quite flattering attention. John bustled out to the map, full of importance, and pointed to Romney Marsh with his yellow ruler, and I did my best to explain the cause of the sea's retreat here. There are times when I wish fervently that I had more geographical knowledge. This was one of them. Mercifully, the children seemed to understand my halting explanations, and I was fired to go further. Sometimes, I said, the opposite thing happens. The sea encroaches on the land, and then the bottom of the cliffs get washed away. I remembered childhood holidays at walton on Nays and gave a dramatic account of a garden and then finally the house belonging to it sliding down the cliffs into the hungry sea. Perhaps I overdid the drama. There was an awed silence when I finished. John raised his ruler and put it shakily across the wash. It's eaten in there all right, he commented. Patrick and Ernest now walked out unbidden to take a closer look at the map. Look how it's all busted its way up here, claimed, exclaimed Patrick, his eyes on the Bristol Channel. And here, echoed Ernest, peering closely at the Thames estuary, looks as though they could meet real easy and chop us in half. How quick, asked Joseph Coggs nervously, do the water come? You remember Beresford, inquired John. It came in at us like lightning, terrible strong it was. Fair sucked us off our feet when we was paddling, and I got my best trousers absolutely sopping. I did my best to calm their fears. If I weren't careful, I could see that I should have some very cross parents coming to see me on the morrow, complaining that their children had been having nightmares. 
Good heavens, I said robustly, it only manages a few inches a year at the most. You've nothing to fear here living in Fairacre. Why, we're safely in the middle, I, uh, I assured them, appropriating John's ruler and pointing out Caxley, printed in unflatteringly small letters. These downland children see very little water, and the sea but rarely. There is a very healthy respect for it when they visit the coast, and their apprehension about inundation was understandable. Even today, some of their grandparents have never seen the sea. St. Patrick's chimes began to ring out through the warm, limpid afternoon. Time to go home, I said. Don't forget there are miles of dry land between you and the sea here in Fairacre. Stand for grace. Within five minutes, the classroom was empty. I returned the map to the shameful cupboard and made my way across the hot playground. To my surprise, Joseph Coggs was swinging on the school gate. His face was thoughtful, his dark eyes fixed upon the horizon. What are you doing? I asked. He nodded toward the vast bulk of the downs, quivering in a blue haze of heat. I was thinking, he said huskily in his hoarse gypsy croak, It'd take a tidy long time for the sea to get through all that lot, wouldn't it, miss? It would, I agreed. He sighed with relief, clambered down from the gate, and set off along the sunny lane toward his home. The long envelope containing the application form was horribly noticeable sticking out from behind the coffee pot. I resolved to tackle it later that evening, but first of all, I made some tea. Mr. Willett was busy at the bottom of my garden, erecting a fine row of bean poles. He cannot bear to see a few yards of untilled soil, and had insisted on turning a miniature jungle of old gooseberry bushes draped in dead grass into a flourishing vegetable patch. The fact that I should never be able to consume a quarter of the crops he was so generously planting did not seem to occur to him, and I was too touched by his kindness to point it out. I took two hefty blue and white striped mugs of tea down the garden path. Balanced on top of one was a plate bearing a large hunk of fruit cake for my gardener. The heat shimmered everywhere and some of the polyanthuses were wilting slightly. My spirits rose at the thought of a possible fine spell. Well, now that do be real welcome, said Mr. Willett, grasping the mug in a mud caked hand. He upturned a wooden box and motioned me politely toward it. I sat down with a sigh and let the sunshine soak into my bones. Little rainbows played around my half-shut eyes. This was the weather. They probably had it like this all the time in Devon, I thought. The sound of steady champing told me that Mr. Willett had found the cake. You makes a very good fruit cake, he said indistinctly, moist without being too heavy, and got your cherries well spaced. Takes a bit of doing that. My wife has a rare job with cherries, flowers them or summit to keep them. You done real well with this, miss. I wished I deserved his compliments, but truth will out. So I replied dreamily, my eyes still closed. Marks and Spencers. Is that so, said Mr. Willett. Well, they does a good job then. There was silence except for the sound of mastication and the birds singing around us. You feeling all right? asked Mr. Willett. You looks a bit peaky to me, and you ain't drinking your tea. I sat up hastily. He was the third person this afternoon to comment on my frail looks. I'm fine, I assured him. Don't look yourself to me, persisted Mr. Willett. Got a sort of bilious look. You ever had the jaundice? I probably need a change, I said briskly. When we get some sunshine, I begin to realize what I've been missing. Perhaps I'd better take a job in France or Italy, I added lightly. Mr. Willett looked concerned. Don't you go flinging off to no foreign parts now, he warned me. Full of mosquitoes and malaria, they tells me. And not a decent drop of water to drink, even if it do come out of a tap. And the food's a proper mess, oily, and that wouldn't do your biliousness any good. You can take my word for it. At this moment, Mrs. Pringle appeared at the side of the house and bore down upon us in all her black-clothed majesty. Her oilcloth bag swung upon her arm, and from it poked a corner of the flowered cretonne overall in which she performs her cleaning duties. Obviously, these were now ended, and she was on her way homeward. "'Cup of tea?' I asked. Mrs. Pringle shook her head magisterially. I never drinks between meals, she said, and I shall be dishing up our high tea in an hour's time. 
Mr. Willett whipped a sack from under the wheelbarrow and spread it with Raleigh-like flourish on the grass. Mrs. Pringle lowered her bulk cautiously upon it and smiled graciously. Ah, nice to have a set down. Sometimes I wonder if this cleaning job's too much for me. I wondered what was coming. Well, not so much the cleaning, continued Mrs. Pringle heavily, as the danger. This was mystifying, but was obviously leading to a grievance. Sweeping, I expect. Scrubbing, I expect. A certain amount of back-breaking, bending, and lifting, I expect, said Mrs. Pringle, rising to heights of rhythmic peroration, which made me suspect Welsh blood somewhere among her forebears. But when, continued the lady, turning and fixing me with a glittering eye, I gets hit over the head through other people's carelessness, then I think it's time to complain. I was about to speak, but was overborne by Mrs. Pringle in full spate. Mr. Willett and I exchanged martyred looks and resigned ourselves to more. I don't say a word about slatternly goings on in ordinary ways. Some are born sluts, no matter how much schooling they've had, and if they cares to muddle along with dust under their beds and the same saucepan for soup as milk, not to mention a bread crock with mildewed crumbs in the cracks, then all I say is, well, let them wallow in their muck and be forbearing. But when those slatternly ways bring damage to others, then plain speaking has to be done. Cough it up, then, I said inelegantly. I could recognize the wallower in muck, all right. What hit you? Nelson's column, by the sound of it, commented Mr. Willett, unimpressed. He dusted some grass from his corduroy trousers and began to resume his tasks. I was sweeping gentle-like by the map cupboard, said Mrs. Pringle with dignity. When the broom knocked against the door, it flew open. Here Mrs. Pringle flung her arms dramatically apart. It flew open, I says, and down crashed a good dozen maps. Gave me a cruel blow on the side of the head. Most dangerous place, that is, near the temple. I'm sorry, I said. That catch isn't very reliable. If maps was hung up properly, continued Mrs. Pringle severely, as they always was in Mr. Hope's time and after, we shouldn't get accidents like this. Might have had a concussion. Might have been disabled. Might have been laid out, intoned Mrs. Pringle. Pity you weren't, said Mr. Willett shortly. I looked away hastily. You are quite right, I said nobly to the old harridan. I really must tidy that cupboard. Do you want something put on your head? Witch hazel, perhaps? Very suitable, muttered Mr. Willett, who was beginning to enjoy himself. Mrs. Pringle gave him a cold glance. Nothing, thank you, replied the lady with crushing dignity. I shall let nature take its course. She began the Herculean task of getting to her feet, swaying backwards and forwards and breathing heavily. I put both arms around one of hers and gave a mighty heave. Suddenly she was erect, red in the face, but triumphant. Thank you, Miss Reed, she puffed. Here, you don't want to lift great weights like that, cried Mr. Willett, who'd only just seen this maneuver, and you not very well. Mrs. Pringle looked at me suspiciously. Not well, she echoed truculently. I'm perfectly well, I said. Mr. Willett, no doubt seeing a means of paying out his old enemy, shook his head vehemently. She's just been talking about having a change. Can't blame her either with folks like you to plague her. A change does us all good, conceded Mrs. Pringle. She looked at me warily as though remembering something. As long as it don't last too long. I shouldn't think about a permanent change if I was you. Taking it all in all, you could jump from the frying pan into the fire, and Fair Acre ain't a bad place when all's said and done. She fished inside the oilcloth bag and produced a brown paper one. Six eggs, said Mrs. Pringle, thrusting them upon me. I brought them up when I come, expecting you'd still be in school, but seems you packed up before the time was done today. Good job officer don't know what goes on. It's very good of you, I said with sincerity, especially after your accident. Mrs. Pringle grunted and set off up the garden path. I'll do my best to put these away tidily. <clears throat> hmm, commented Mrs. Pringle, with one hand on the latch of the gate. There's some, no matter how much schooling they've had, what never learns. Triumphant as ever, she continued on her way. Back in the solitude of my house, I found myself putting off the task of filling in the application form. 
I sorted the laundry, cleaned the dining room windows, shone up in all their squalor by the bright sunlight, and generally fiddled about in a procrastinating mood. Should I apply or not? Now that the sun shone again, I began to shilly-shally. I remembered the peaceful view from the top of the downs. Mrs. Pringle was right when she said that Fairacre took some beating. She seemed to know an astonishing amount about my present proposals, I thought, remembering her advice about making a change. There was little doubt in my mind that the lady had been snooping at the contents of the long envelope in the course of her cleaning. I had suspected this before. Looking at it in one way, I mused it was really rather flattering that she advised me to stay. Perhaps she enjoyed in my slatternly ways after all. I paused in my window cleaning and gazed at Tibby basking on the top of the rainwater butt in one of his favorite spots. How would he react to a move, I wondered. The chances of getting the job were one in a hundred, I well knew. There would be a host of applicants for such a tempting post, and a house with it meant that there would be double the number at least. Why not send in my application form and let the gods decide? After all, if I were lucky enough to be called up for the interview, I could make up my mind then. I groaned in turmoil of spirit. How truly dreadful it is to have to make a decision. No, I was sure that I could not leave this to the gods. This was something I must settle for myself here and now. Either I applied because I really wanted the post, or I would decide to stay on in Fairacre. Having got this far, I went over the reasons for and against all over again. It was a wearing business. I should simply hate to leave the Fairacre children and all the friends in the village. There would be more children and friends in Devon, I answered myself, and this little house is extremely attractive. The Devon one is even better, said my second self. I should be leaving a job which I knew I could manage fairly competently. All the more reason for trying something more ambitious, commented my nagging half. Perhaps this was the secret. Perhaps I should be more adventurous, stretch myself a little, climb out of my rut. I was too fond of clinging to the present, to the things I knew, the friends about me. Amy was possibly right to urge me to make a change. Fairacre was not the only place in the world. It was time I uprooted myself. Now or never. I took out the application form from the envelope and spread it on the table. I must say it looked rather daunting. I whipped out my fountain pen before I weakened again, and at that moment the telephone bell rang. It was Amy. I was glad to hear her voice. Now I should get some much-needed moral support, I felt sure. I'm just filling in that application form, I told her rather proudly after the first civilities were over. Only just, asked Amy. She sounded incredulous. It doesn't have to be in for a few days yet, I answered defensively. But you've had it there over a week, answered Amy severely. I quite thought it had been sent off long ago. I began to feel rather hurt. I had to think about it, I said in an injured tone. Stuff and nonsense, snorted Amy. We worked it all out together last week. In any case, it's your move now that I've rung up about. What do you mean, my move, I asked. Aren't you counting my chickens for me rather prematurely? Amy brushed my tartness aside. I met Lucy Colgate at a party yesterday, she said, and told her about your plans. She's interested in Fairacre School, and I'm pretty sure she'll apply when you leave. Lucy Colgate? I was speechless, as if it wasn't bad enough to have Amy busying herself about my affairs and bullying me into action without adding the insult of Lucy Colgate. She had been at college with Amy and me, and try as I might, and I must admit I did not try very hard, I could not take to her. I found her domineering, utterly self-centered, and painfully affected. No doubt she considered me equally unpleasant. In any case, we met as little as possible, but Amy kept in touch. The very thought of Lucy teasing, teaching in my school and living in my house was enough to make me bristle. Amy, I said firmly, you take too much on yourself. At times like this, you strain the bonds of friendship to snapping point. Are you telling me that you are still trying to make up your mind? demanded Amy shrilly. No, I said grimly. It's made up now. And I slammed down the receiver. I think you can guess which way she made up her mind. 
but we'll go on with her meditations a little further next time.